Well, hello, y'all. Thanks for joining the panel on What's a Cannabinoid and Will It Get Me High? I hope our discussion today will be informative and educational and give you some insight into Cannabinoids 101. To kick things off, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Shada Tarabi, and I'm your moderator for this discussion. I'm a proud born and raised Austinite who founded one of Texas's premier cannabis brands, Restart CBD, back in 2018 with my two younger sisters. We're an education first brand and create a lot of content to better help the community understand the power of this plant. In addition to running Restart CBD, I'm also the host of a cannabis and marketing podcast called To Be Blunt, where I talk to industry professionals from Texas to Colorado and California and beyond on how they market and grow their canna businesses and brands. So it's a big honor to be here with y'all today for this monumental event reflecting Texas cannabis and beyond. I'm going to invite each of my panelists now to share a short introduction on who they are and what they do, and then we'll dive into today's topic. So let's start with Franny Tacey. Welcome to the panel. Well, thanks for having me. Having me here, I'm super excited. Love Willie Nelson from the time I was born. Um, so my name is Franny Tacey, and we are based out of Asheville, North Carolina. I was the first female farmer to plant hemp in 2017. And now, uh, just a few years later, we are vertically integrated. We have a uh, processing, manufacturing, distribution, franchising, 11 dispensaries in five states, and growing. So we have Seed to Shelf, Hemp and Health. It's Franny's Pharmacy, spelled with a F-A-R-M, putting the farm back in the pharmacy. Thank you so much for being here, Franny. I'm definitely excited to share your wealth of information and stories of what it has been like to be a farmer and to grow this beautiful plant that we are all here to talk about today. I'm going to now pass it off to Leah. Welcome to the panel. Please introduce yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Leah Laxtons. I'm the co-founder of Higher Ed Hemp Tours and Hemp Business Builder. And we're based here in Austin, Texas. Our mission is to bridge the gap between brand and consumer. And we do this by working with the tourism industry to create immersive hemp experiences and um, educate, verify, and empower brands as well so that they can really provide what consumers are looking for. I'm super, super stoked to be here with these amazing ladies today. And of course, happy birthday, Willie. That's right. Happy birthday, Mr. Willie Nelson, for bringing us all together. And thanks, Leah. I, I've been a part of some of your tours and you've been a great resource for myself as I've been navigating cannabis here in Texas. And last but certainly not least, Jocelyn, welcome to the panel. Please introduce yourself. Hello, Shada. Yeah, it's good to be here. Um, I am, I'm also a really big Willie Nelson fan. I have a poster behind me that I got at the first Hall of Flowers. I'm based in California and Willie's Reserve is one of my favorite brands just because I'm a lover of sun-grown outdoor flower. Um, but anyways, I'm the director of industry relations at Headset and we are the leading cannabis analytics company. And so we're providing a couple different pieces of software for the dispensaries, the brands, and really, we're supplying the industry with a real-time read in what's happening in the market, which, as we all know, whether you're working in this industry or a consumer, things are changing so quickly. It is incredible how fast consumer, change, consumer trends are changing, how many new products are coming onto the market. So it's really important that we have some way of understanding what's happening in terms of consumer sales, consumer trends. And so what Headset is doing is really providing this read on the market by analyzing all of the point of sale data in dispensaries and then providing a bunch of different reports, software to really understand what's happening in the market. So I'm happy to share what we've been learning um, over the past couple of years. I really cannot wait. You always bring the data. And just to echo for anybody listening, all of us are very social. If there are things that you resonate with, take notes, ask questions, the comments, we're going to be reflecting on those at the end doing a Q&A. But I just want to encourage you to be kind of curious. That's what the whole purpose of this discussion is all about. And so without further ado, I'm going to kind of kick things off by diving into you know our topic. It's all about cannabinoids. And before I get to the first question, and I want to kind of set the tone. Cannabinoids are found in the cannabis plant. And so obviously some of the panelists have highlighted hemp as well as, you know, marijuana coming from a legal market. Cannabis encompasses all of that. And cannabinoids exist in 
all of the cannabis plant. And so, yes, there is marijuana, there is hemp, there's definitely different degrees of cannabinoids, which we're going to dive into. And so the first question really is for Franny, please help us break down what is a cannabinoid and how does that work with our endocannabinoid system? Well, we were all born and designed, obviously, from the way that our anatomy and physiology is to uptake cannabis. We have up to all mammals, ha all mammals have cannabinoid systems. We, women and dogs happen to have the most. Um, and there's about 300 and they're all located all throughout our bodies. There are um, brains and our nervous systems all throughout our organs. So when we uptake cannabis in any of its form, it has up to 100 different cannabinoids in it. THC, the high cannabinoid, CBD, I call it a hug, all these different ones. So when we consume them, our body is meant, they're like little Pac-Man. They're going to go and get them and take them to where they need to be. So there's all sorts of really great pictures and so forth that you can look at when you search to show how they're distributed through the system. So that's a really quick one. <laughs> no, that was super yeah. helpful. I think to emphasize too, people sometimes have the stigma of what a cannabinoid is like, ooh, it's cannabis. I don't want to consume it, especially here in some of the Southern states reflecting Texas, you know, CBD has been a huge uh, market for us. And really, I think CBD and the education of CBD has really cracked the door open for us to discuss all these other cannabinoids that have existed in the cannabis plant infinitely. Like these cannabinoids are not new to the cannabis plant, but they're certainly new to the market. And so my next question is to Leah, you know, reflecting on what the consumer journey is as you're kind of out in the market and you're hearing, you know, CBD and THC, and now there's other cannabinoids hitting the market. What are some of the questions that consumers are starting to have when they're beginning their cannabis journey? And how do you see brands start to address that conversation? Yeah, definitely. Well, here in Austin, where most of our tours are focused, we do get a lot of individuals who have never tried cannabis at all. And if you look at the California Cannabis Tourism Association stats, it's similar for tours all across the country, like over 30% of our guests. So that's super exciting because it's people that literally know nothing. So um, and then we do have the more educated consumers as well, especially now they're starting to be interested in CBG and, of course, Delta 8 and have questions about those things. But that 32 percent that are this is their first time, you know, right off the bat, they want to know, does CBD get me high? Is this mm -hmm. going to show up on a drug test? Um, what, how much should I take? That's a huge one because then it can be difficult for brands to start to navigate what they can and cannot say in that scenario as well. So it's a little bit of consumer frustration there because often they're directed to kind of have to research it on their own. And that really is just the nature of the regulations and the way the FDA has worded a lot of things in FTC. So it's exciting that we have all these new inter interested individuals, but there's definitely a lot of misinformation and things that we're continuing to break down. I'd also say that the strain names are very confusing to a lot of yeah. consumers, especially now that we're starting to see like OG Kush be a hemp strain, smokable strain. And there's a lot of confusion around the terpenes and indica, sativa, what all these things need. But consumers are educating themselves with so many amazing resources, like even this panel. And I would say that I see the future uh, seeing more complicated questions that brands will be able to answer and utilize to create that consumer experience. Yeah, you highlighted some cannabinoids, which obviously that's the topic of today's panel. So I want to just kind of, you know, outline for the listeners, certain cannabinoids are legal or illegal depending on what state you live in. So if you are from, let's say, Texas, where we're based, Delta 9 THC. Now, most people might be just familiar with the word THC. 
now there's a bunch of other THCs that are hitting the market. Um, but just to kind of, you know, focus on just THC, Delta 9 THC, the main one that makes you psychotropically high, that is not legal in Texas and it's not federally legal. But we are able in a hemp market capacity to sell less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. So you have these different cannabinoids now that are, again, coming to market. Some are more newer than others, but they've all existed in the cannabis plant. And now people are are kind of extracting them, they're compounding mm -hmm. them, they're formulating them, they're turning them into these different products. And so I just wanted to highlight that for the listeners, depending on where you live, certain cannabinoids may or may not be legal, but I do encourage you to lean into discovering what cannabinoid makes you feel best. I love that Franny highlighted, you know, CBD to her makes her feel like a nice little hug. I love taking CBD in addition to THC. I know people sometimes, you know, they have certain feelings over one cannabinoid or another, I think especially as the market was very new, but now as we're evolving into a more educated market, people are definitely getting um, a chance to explore and see what it feels like in their body. So kind of leading into that topic, I want to turn it over to Jocelyn to understand and get a perspective of, are there better products depending on how someone may want to feel that, you know, people should be be looking out for like obviously there's edibles smokables there's tinctures there's now wax and shatter and concentrate and there's a whole plethora of products that have opened up in the market but what would you say to someone who's who's like a new consumer <clears throat> who's trying to explore based on these different cannabinoids and products like where do i begin yeah okay this is this is really important um so the first thing I'm actually, I'm going to start with an analogy um, that hopefully many people will understand. I'm assuming there's a lot of music lovers um, listening in right now. So when we think about the endocannabinoid system, there's something really important that happens that's called the entourage effect that maybe you've heard of before. And so what happens is um, when we smoke or when we vaporize cannabis, our bodies are taking in hundreds of these botanical compounds. And each one is arriving with these unique effects, these different benefits, and this can change our behavior or the, the, the interaction of that with these different compounds interacting. So the way that you can think about this, I'm gonna use this music analogy, is the entourage effect is sort of like a band or a symphony, right? Okay, so we've got a guitar player, okay? And it's wonderful to listen to the guitar on its own, right? A guitar soloist, a piano soloist, a drum solo. These things are wonderful to listen to on their own. But it's a very different experience when you're bringing the guitar and the piano and the drums and the chorus when you're bringing all of that together. So when we're thinking about cannabis and we're thinking about THC, we're thinking about CBD, these different compounds, this is how we want to think about it in a sense. Are you looking for the badass guitar solo, which is maybe I'm going to compare to THC, let's say 100% THC, you're going to get this effect that's like, big and bold and you're going to get higher at, versus if you're having a mellow piano, just CBD versus combining all of these different instruments, right? This is what we think of what we're, what we're referring to when we talk about this entourage effect. So the first thing that we really want to understand is in different products. So when there's flour or when we're looking at products like edibles, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is about the distillation process. So is this a full spectrum plant or is it being distilled down? If we think about prior to the cannabis industry really maturing and being what it is now, a lot of people were making edibles on their own and they're making it through a can of butter, right? You're using the whole plant, you're making it, you're getting the full plant in there. Now this is very different from when edible manufacturers today, which most of them are using distillate. This is a very different process. This is distilling down the plant. You're taking parts of it. Maybe you're adding different terpenes. Maybe you're adding different things into there, right? This is going to be a different experience for you as a consumer in, in how the, the product is actually made. So for consumers, what you really need to think about, and this is like anything that we're consuming from an agricultural product to anything we put in our bodies, you've got to learn to be able to read labels because the label is going to tell you, is this a live <clears throat> resin? Is this a distillate product? What is the milligrams that are on this product? The thing that I would really recommend, and actually I just did this for myself last week because I'm a flower lover. So for me, when I was saying like, I love Willie's Reserve, Sun Grown Outdoor, very important to me. But people often don't know if it's the difference between indoor, the percentage of THC, are there terpenes added? We have to get used to reading labels. And then the other thing about this is understanding and A-B testing like we, 
there, our bodies interact with cannabis so different, right? So yeah. there is nothing that I could recommend and say, hey, this is going to work for you and this is going to work for you. I have no idea. So what we have to do is we have to test this on ourselves. So I'm going to give an example of something I just did last week. So I love flour. I'm not as much into edibles. Um, Shada, you were mentioning your throat earlier and it kind of hurting from just years of consumption, which same. So I'm testing out different products for myself. So one of the things is I'm talking about a live resin versus distillate. Again, this concept of a whole plant versus product being distilled. So what I did is I tested 10 milligrams. Uh, generally, you want to start with five. So start low and go. Yeah. So yeah. I was testing 10 milligrams. One of them was a live resin edible and the other was from a distillate product and then what you got to do is you got to take notes and say okay i noticed that this 10 milligrams with the live resin it made me feel and this is for me personally a little bit less edgy the distilled products it, they, they make for me personally a little bit more of that anxiety edginess feeling whereas the distillate or the the live resin product was a little bit more of a mellow high for me so anyways, my point is you got to figure out how this interacts with your body, but do a, a, a study, a controlled study on yourself, A, B tested on yourself with comparative products, comparative milligrams, and then understand how your body is going to react to that. So again, I guess just to summarize here, really read labels. This is so, so important. This is also, remember this industry is very new, right? We are, especially with new form factors coming out. We don't know a lot of things. We don't know what we don't know yet. And we're still doing more scientific research to understand our endocannabinoid system. So right now, the onerous is on you. So you really need to take control of this yourself. Um, and so that's, you know, hopefully some good places to start. And those, those learnings should be applied whatever form factor you're wanting to take in, whether it's smoking, whether it's an edible, a tincture, a topical, you need to have that same kind of mindset. I love that you highlighted kind of using your own body as kind of the subject and then documenting it. That came up in another panel that I was participating with earlier because it is true. Everybody's body is so different. And I'm sure there's somebody in the audience who's like, I tried CBD. It didn't work for me. Or I smoked this strain and it was, it got me too high. I didn't like the way it made me feel. It's not that that product is inherently bad or will give all of us that same negative or unwanted effect. It's how does that product work in your body? What is that milligram? What is that consumption method? And it's something I want to highlight for the listeners too is bioavailability. That's a fancy scientific medical term, but it really just means, you know, how much is your body going to absorb? So usually in our dispensary, we talk to consumers saying, if you're looking for a fast acting effect, you want to feel the effects the quickest, you're going to want to smoke something versus mm -hmm. if you are looking for maybe a long-term effect, edibles, they take time to digest, but they're going to maybe last in your system longer. I don't know if somebody's ever eaten an edible and then you got a little too high, but that's that's Delta nine, maybe too much Delta nine. You can kind of take that same approach with these different cannabinoids. So CBD doesn't make you psychotropically high, but maybe it is, you get that nice warm hug. It makes you feel better longer. So again, encouraging the listeners to play around with not only these different um, consumption methods, but also these different cannabinoids and how that will ultimately impact their specific bodies. So now I want to turn it over to Leah, you know, um, or sorry, to Franny, you are growing cannabis. You're growing hemp in Asheville. You also have a, so you're, you're what the industry kind of refers to as vertical integration. So it's not um, always, I don't want to get into vertical integration, but just for the audience to understand, it means you grow the plant, you're extracting the plant, you're putting those products on the shelf. So you have a full understanding of kind of seed to sale. So what are you um, observing in terms of how consumers are getting cannabis products? Like what is the, the life cycle from the farm to the dispensary in terms of customers who are wanting to smoke your flower or use your tincture? Kind of give us that farmer's perspective of cannabinoids. So <clears throat> we, we grow here, but we're also part of NC State Research and Women in Hemp, pro um, Women in Hemp Nonprofit where we're growing um, similar varieties, the same variety through geneticists on lots of different sites. So we, this year, when we're all done with this year's grow, it'll be the first three year farm research data. And it's being led by five female researchers, which is pretty amazing and cool. So it's always a learning process. What we have seen in our first year is very different from a second and third year. So, 
I came from pharmaceuticals. That's our manufacturing. That's all the science and research geeky stuff. What we're finding and what you had even mentioned earlier, we have names and varieties of hemp that are now on the THC marijuana side and the hemp and CBD side. So there's a lot of confusion with that. So our brand and what we do is stick specifically with these researchers and these specific strains and brands from Front Range Biosciences and Triangle Hemp. So we now have a farmer network with lots of dozens of farmers in this region and across the country. So a lot of these questions, if anybody says this is exactly it and this is how it rolls, it's not true. Uh, there's This plant is designed to adapt as well. So it's very, very interesting. We're getting consistent results in the COAs. And this is something that our brand led the way in North Carolina. We encourage any and everybody as a consumer, always ask the source, where did it come from? Um, a COA is a certificate of an analysis. It's gonna talk to you and tell you what is in that plant that got used in the product. So what we do for instance is QR code our products. So that if you look and you, everybody's used to this now at COVID, right? From a menu to anything, if you picture that QR code, it's going to take you to what an analysis looks like of the plant we used in that product. So we are very consistently using the same product in our baseline. And we have for the past three years, obviously for the consistency of that. And on our farm now, we've reduced some of our grow and we do more of an educational tour where we grow different varieties because these questions you're asking, it's all part of research and what we're doing to evolve and learn more about these plants. So like Leah does hemp, hemp tours, we have hemp tours where we actually show you a lot of these varieties because some of it is more than actually what it's producing in the cannabinoids and the terpenes. But as we look into this, we've got CBN, CBG, all these different um, terpenes, which give it the flavor and the taste and the smell. Um, so there's more and more, we're getting more varieties all the time. Um, so it's really important as you are looking into products, especially smokable hemp, to do your own research. I love what we're all talking about here is experience it, experience experience it. It is start low, go slow, try a lot of different things. And when you find something that works, stick with it. Be loyal to the brand and the person and the company you found. I promise you they've done a lot of work to get there. And that's what a lot of us are offering too when we have dispensaries. You know, you get to go in and talk to a bud tender and really get down into the details. And while you're experimenting and experimenting with different varieties and brands, you'll learn what you like. I love that you highlighted from a high level for us what goes on behind the scenes. I think so much so often, you know, there's new cannabinoids that are hitting the market and consumers kind of, you know, they don't know where the cannabinoid came from. It's kind of a like, oh, did someone just make this all of a sudden? And and part of it is we have to do the research to have accessibility. The genetics have to come a long way. Um, I'm about to pass a question to Leah to get into some of these cannabinoids, but I know Delta-8 is a really big one for those mm -hmm. of us on um, legal marijuana states. People are like, well, where did Delta-8 come from? I'm like, well, there weren't people really manufacturing it, but part of that too is Delta-8 doesn't grow organically and not organically in the sense of like, is it organic and safe for me to eat or consume? But like naturally is probably a better word. It's not a high abundant cannabinoid that exists naturally in nature. And so therefore there is some manipulation to some of these cannabinoids. And then Jocelyn also highlighted certain, you know, you're isolating certain cannabinoids out. So hopefully again, we're painting this picture for the consumer to understand we're learning as more research is made available to us through the universities, these research facilities, through obviously companies like Jocelyn's with Headset who are doing the data analysis on what consumers are actually buying and enjoying. And then just to kind of you know emphasize what Franny said, hemp and CBD and marijuana and Delta 9, like all these aspects of it, they're, they're not made equal. One farmer can grow the same strain as farmer you know A to Z, same state, 
still will have discrepancies. Different state, same strain discrepancies. There's just so much nuance to it that um, indoor, or Jocelyn mentioned indoor grow versus outdoor grow. Those all add variabilities to the ultimate effect of how that particular product or cannabinoid or combination of cannabinoids and terpenes will ultimately affect your body. And so again, just kind of keeping that in the back of your head, if you find something that works, write it down, take a note, be loyal to that product, um, and then ask questions. Be very curious of the brands that you're, you're support, supporting and, and choosing to um, you know, put their products in your body um, because they are doing a lot of effort and energy in helping educate and help us better understand. So kind of on that vein, Leah, there's so many new cannabinoids popping up. We talked about hemp versus marijuana, but help us break down some of the more popular ones. What is the difference between CBD, CBG, CBN, and now you have Delta? to nine versus Delta eight and even Delta 10 is hitting the market. Yeah. Soon. Yeah, definitely. These are all cannabinoids and there's more than a hundred as Franny mentioned earlier. So more are going to keep coming out on a regular basis. But like Shada mentioned, one of the biggest differences is what's found naturally occurring in the plant and what takes an additional process. So CBD, CBG, Delta nine, these are all naturally occurring in cannabis and hemp plants in different percentages. Delta-8 and CBN are usually an additional process. CBN converts from Delta-9. It can be found in the plant in limited quantities, but typically what we're seeing on the market is isolated form of that converted from Delta-9. And Delta-8 similarly is converted from CBD isolate. Uh, into this uh, sort of psychoactive compound that if, you know, you're in a state that doesn't have combined Delta 9 test or Delta, all Delta THC testing, and they're only saying Delta 9, like here in Texas currently, then mm -hmm. a Delta 8 hemp derived product, most attorneys would argue is legal here. And you see it at retailers all over the state. So that may be what's happening in your state. There are some states where Delta 8 is not allowed. So you just have to look at your state rules and regulations. And there's certainly a lot going on even currently in legislature. So, and like you mentioned, just because these products aren't naturally occurring in high quantities in the plant, doesn't make them bad. There are a lot of different manufacturing processes, though, that the consumer may not be aware of, um, that you just want to make sure you're getting these products from a trusted source. And how they make you feel at the end of the day when you take your notes is what's really going to guide whether you go back to that cannabinoid or you try something new. I think CBG is really exciting for multiple reasons. Uh, for farmers, it's easier in hemp states because it typically has very low levels of THC. And then from a lot of the studies that are going on, it has many therapeutic benefits. So I think it's exciting to see that happening. CBN, certainly, because there is an effect. It makes you drowsy. For almost everyone, it's going to make you drowsy. So that's also another very popular up-and-coming cannabinoid. But it's been all about the Delta 8 now for, oh man, it's six, eight months, I think, here in Texas. And throughout the country, I hear the same thing. So will it stay legal? We'll find out and time will tell. Uh, but it's interesting that it shows people want to be legally compliant because they, you might think, well, there's black markets, legacy markets across the country, but it shows people want the experience of going into a retail store and buying THC legally. And I believe that's really encouraging and interesting consumer behavior um, across the board. Thank you. I love that you highlighted all of that. One thing just to kind of further emphasize for the listeners is I think when we first got into the CBD market here in Austin, opening our dispensary, we started out with an isolate based product. And so I know there's a lot of talk about isolate versus full spectrum or full plant. And then obviously we're highlighting different cannabinoids. I just wanted to give a quick overview. When we say isolate, that means a singular cannabinoid. So if you're just purchasing a CBD only product, there's no other cannabinoids. There's there's no terpenes. It's just CBD isolate out. You're also seeing that now reflected in Delta 8. Delta 8 is being sold as an isolate versus full spectrum products or blends or formulations. I'm not saying one is right or wrong. I just know when we first launched in the market, there was a lot of fuss around if it's not full spectrum, it's not full plant, it's not going to be effective. And I really like to challenge that thinking because I think that if that was the case, then you wouldn't see pharmaceuticals being turned into. So there is a FDA 
FDA approved drug on CBD called Epidiolex. It is a CBD isolate, again, a singular cannabinoid. Like Leah said, there's Delta 8. We sell singular Delta 8 cannabinoids. We also sell full spectrum products. There's blends of CBD and CBG, or I have a blend of Delta 8 and CBN for an extra, you know, night. <laughs> but just to kind of, again, emphasize for the audience, there's so many cannabinoids and they work independent. They work together. One might be better for you, what you're taking it for. I'm also very excited about CBG. I think there's a lot yep. of news and stuff for us to uncover and unpack with these cannabinoids. And part of it stems, unfortunately, with the lack of proper research, I can't you know, scientifically say this is what it does. But anecdotally, the amount of information that we're hearing from our customers and, and helping us, you know, create that narrative around what these different cannabinoids are and how these different cannabinoids can help. So I'm going to kind of pass it to Jocelyn, queen of all the data points. I know she's got a lot to share with us. What trends are you observing at a national level on cannabis consumption? Are you noticing certain cannabinoids? Are you noticing, you know, certain <laughs> consumers are now coming to market? I know for us in Texas, we thought with the lack of legal THC, it was, you know, going to be a different market. But now we're really seeing everybody is really open minded mm -hmm. to cannabis. It's not just this younger market who's hungry for this plant. And so, you know, what are some of the main data points that are driving people towards being can of curious? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a lot to share on this, but I have to just make one comment on just kind of everything that we're talking about prior about really understanding the brands. Um, I, I just Okay, so I'm based in California and for headset, I work ac all across North America as well as Canada. And one thing that I think is really important to remember here is that each state is they're voting in cannabis and saying that, yes, we're going to have cannabis licenses, retail, we're going to allow cultivation, etc. Each state has different ways in which that supply chain works. So as a consumer, this is, again, something that I think you really need to take into your own hands in understanding how the supply chain works for you. Because, for example, in California, we have vertical integration, we have distribution, meaning that the producer has to have a distribution license to be able to go sell into the dispensary, or they have to work through another license to go sell into the dispensary. As a brand without a distribution license, you can't just go sell into a dispensary. Now, Washington, for example, that's not how it works. They don't have any distribution there. So a brand can go sell directly into a dispensary. And so this changes our motivations for companies, right? Based off the dynamics of how that state and how all the, the licensing and how the regulations work. So one more thing that I think is very important to think about here is understanding the motivations from the brand side. Because cannabis is very regulated when it comes to marketing, but also not very well understood when it comes to marketing, there's a lot of buzzwords that are being used. So you really need to understand how to read between the lines of what the motivation of that company may be. Now, I was giving the example earlier how most edibles are distillate. And there's pros and cons to this, right? Like we we're Shada was just giving the example. Is this a full spectrum? Is this a whole plant that's being used? Or are you distilling out one piece of this plant? So when we know that most of the edibles are distilled, then from there, a pro of that is, is most people don't like the taste of cannabis. So when you get these new cannabis consumers that are coming in, which to go into where's the data going and what are the trends, edibles are certainly one of edibles, beverages. These are two of the fastest growing categories within cannabis that are bringing new people in because it seems like a safer option than flour. Flour can be very scary to people. And like I'm saying, a lot of people don't actually like the taste of a flower. So when you're making an edible, the edible manufacturers or the beverage manufacturers, you hear a lot about some of these beverage drinks not tasting that great, right? So the challenge for the beverage manufacturer is they're trying to please the customer and they're saying, well, hey, we want this to taste good. So they have to ask themselves a question. Are we optimizing for taste or are we optimizing for a health and wellness benefit, i.e. maybe a full spectrum plant. So they have to make these decisions. So you need to know what is the ethos? What is that brand value? Are they valuing scale? Are they valuing um, taste, right? If they're seeing those things, then they're probably going to be going through that distilled process. And I'm not saying anything bad about that. But then there's other brands that maybe are going to be more craft brands, right? And their, their mentality, their thought process, like, hey, we believe in whole plants. So for us, our process, we're going to have less scale on this, 
but we're going to make sure that it's coming directly from our farm or a farm that we trust, whatever it may be. In cannabis, because there are a lot of brands, there's a lot of companies that are wholesaling flour, right? So you can go purchase flour and create your own brand. Anyone can do this and you piggyback off someone else's license. I mean, you can do it with enough capital. So again, from a consumer standpoint, you need to understand what is this company? What do they value? Are they producing the flour themselves? Are they growing it themselves? Are they distilling it? Are they using the whole plant? You've got to understand how the supply chain works. And prior to working in the cannabis industry, I'm three years into the industry, spent my career in tech prior to this. I had no idea about how food even got to me. I wasn't thinking like, oh, what is the process that when I'm buying a box of cereal or an apple or a wine, like how does it go from point A, i.e. being grown in the ground to then being sold as a product? Oftentimes people aren't thinking about this. And in cannabis, this is very important that people understand this. So I just really want to talk about this because in California, for example, we've got almost a thousand different brands on the market or on the shelves. It's a lot of different products, right? A lot of different brands. How can anyone consumer understand the difference between all these brands? So we need to ask ourselves the questions of motivation and company values. And this goes beyond just what is it saying on the box or in their marketing? No, you've got to read between the lines and learn how to read labels. So I just want to put that out there. So from the consumer trend standpoint, um, so, okay, I want to clarify as I'm giving all this data, where this data is coming from, because this is also very important that we're asking ourselves critical questions when we're saying consumer trends, what does this mean and what is the data? So there's two different things that as a consumer, a couple different companies or research that you can be doing that's going to help you better understand what some of these trends are, because I could speak on a panel about this for hours about all the different things that are going on. So I want to leave you with something really tangible. So for headset, what we're doing is we're analyzing all the point of sale data in dispensaries. So we're aggregating all this data in each state or Canadian province. And then once we see a statistically sound enough of a sample, so generally around 20% of sales in that state, then we have a good understanding of what's happening. So just in general, across all of the states from headset, what we're seeing is consumers, it's about even from male to female, almost 50-50, in terms of both of, of these different demographic groups using cannabis. Millennials, this is the largest group of people that are using cannabis, 50%, but it's everyone. 25% um, is um, old, older generations are using cannabis. So there's everyone is using this um, and they're using it in different ways. So younger generations, they're very attracted to vapes. We see higher percentages of use among vapes edibles, beverages, these are bringing in new consumers. And if you just think about it from like a, I guess, part common sense, these form factors seem a lot less scary, right? So if you are thinking about trying something where you're, you know, flower might seem scary to you, those are great options to be able to do that. And we're certainly seeing that reflected in the data. Um, lastly, one really exciting thing for the industry as a whole, and just signals how big the opportunity is within cannabis, not just from like a economic, financial, but just really from a social standpoint. Um, 420, this was on record, the single largest day of cannabis sales on record. Yeah. We had in California, Colorado, Washington, Nevada, mm -hmm. and Oregon, when we're looking at all those sales, we did almost $44 million on this one day. Canada, in all of their legal markets, did about 5 million CAD. So this is huge. I was also just looking at um, New Frontier, which is another data company in the cannabis industry who they do survey data. So headset I mentioned is analyzing the point of sale data in real time. New Frontier, they just published this report, I think a couple weeks, two weeks ago maybe, where they did a survey out to almost 5,000 people across the US and they were asking them a bevy of questions of how has your consumer preferences changed from a survey that they did in 2018? And so they were looking at what products do you like to consume? Where are you purchasing cannabis? Are you getting it from a friend? Are you getting it from a brick and mortar dispensary delivery? Are you getting it on the illicit market? Bevy of different questions that they were asking the consumers, wealth of information. So I highly recommend reading this, this report. Um, but what I wanted to say from that is um, what they're seeing, they did this analysis and I just, I'm gonna read this really quickly because this is how popular cannabis is and how much it's growing. So right now, <clears throat> the annual spend, 
cannabis is the fourth largest consumer spending category. Soft drinks are making up 146 billion in sales over the last 12 month period, their annual revenue. Beer, 119 billion. Tobacco, about 99 billion. And then cannabis, again, nationwide, about 88 billion. So this is surpassing coffee sales, this is surpassing wine sales, spirits, digital entertainment, craft beer, like that is how popular this is. But the interesting thing with cannabis is that certain people, certain demographic groups are more interested in talking about it than others or more comfortable talking about it than others. And if we think about it, this is the younger generations and this actually was something that they studied in this 5,000 person survey. Younger generations are much more comfortable talking about this. And so what we know then from that is as people is this being destigmatized, as people are talking about this openly in society, and as we see Gen Z and younger demographic groups starting to purchase at larger rates than older demographics, they're growing up in this where cannabis is just normal. A lot of us grew up in, we were, had dare, we had all these things where our perception was just that this is negative and bad. We think about their group, that's not the world that they're growing into. So this is really just the start of such a massive societal, economic, philosophical shift for us right now. And it's really important to look at the actual, like how big this is or what's really happening. And we can see just from some of these data points that I just mentioned, this is so much more popular than oftentimes we even realize when we actually break down the data and we're looking at, oh my gosh, this is the fourth largest consumer industry at this point. But again, not everyone is comfortable talking about it. So hopefully that gives some context of who's comfortable talking about how this is going to grow and so forth. That was amazing. I, I knew that you were going to bring some heavy numbers to the panel. And I'm really glad that you did because I think it puts it in frame for everybody listening. And even for those of us who are on the panel who are in the industry trying to navigate it, I know I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful for me. Um, we're almost at time. I do want to kind of ask Franny a question just because it was in, you know, kind of the, the tagline of the, of the panel. Will CBD get you high? And, you know, kind of the perception of CBD making you fail a drug test. Um, there's obviously so many different cannabinoids and people are just so focused on this high effect, whether you want to be high or you don't want to be high. And kind of what's your perspective? What do you say to that? Well, CBD, I have yet to find that it would ever get me high. Um, and personally, um, I've taken many a drug test to to. Uh, test that theory. Uh, there is some research that indicates if you're taking super mega doses of it, that it could show up on a drug test. I still have yet to know anyone where it was truthfully CBD. Um, so CBD is safe. It's safe. This is the one thing that we have so much anecdotal reviews. We're not physicians, so we don't give medical advice have yet to see it in four years and thousands and thousands and thousands of customers. Test results, CBD, no psychoactive effects, but you do feel things. This is why cannabis is legal, people. This is why we did it. This is why people went to jail for this. And why we have fought so hard is because cannabis and all forms of cannabis, whether it be hemp, marijuana, it's effective, it works. And what's the worst thing that could happen? It didn't work for you and you want to up your dose or titrate or try some other things. What's the best that could happen? That it worked for you. So CBD, very, very safe. It is non-psychoactive. It is very wonderful in all its, all its ways to consume it. So we'd all hit on that. You can smoke it for the fastest sublingual under the tongue is that 15 to 20 minute onset goes through your whole system ingestibles all the food and the drinks take a little bit longer but they last longer there's so many different ways topicals go straight on your skin your largest organ and you can feel relief whatever works for you just get in there and try it and stay loyal to the people that are helping you find I just want to thank everybody for all the information that was shared in this panel. And just to echo the words that were said, it's your body. You have to be in control of what you're putting in it. If you don't like something, 
don't keep consuming it. If you do like something, continue to lean into why you like that product, but be curious. Like Franny highlighted, like all of us have been highlighting, some products are effective, some products are not. It's ultimately how you continue to navigate what works best. And as new cannabinoids hit the market, don't be afraid to try them. Again, reach out to any of us. We're all on social media. Um, we're all more than happy to continue the conversation. Definitely go check out um, some of the data that Headset is producing because it's very, very informative yeah. to help guide you as you're navigating through these different products. And if you're in Austin, I know Leah and I would love to come see you as we are navigating Texas's cannabis laws and regulations. But thanks again for having us on this panel at Lux Summit. And we will see you guys later. Bye. Bye. Happy birthday, Willie. <laughs>